This seed organization method doesn't even work the way it's supposed to. I'm telling you, the secret to organizing your seeds is not found in these plastic boxes. I used this method for three years, so you can believe me when I tell you that it's actually garbage, but I will tell you exactly why I think that. There's a couple of things that make this a really awful way to organize your seeds. And I know I'm gonna get a lot of hate for this because it's a very popular method. Just keep in mind, I'm talking about for me personally and how my brain works, having all these containers, whether it says flowers, herbs, peas, beans, still doesn't give me enough of an idea of what's inside before I actually open it. And having to open this latch, pull this out, fan out all the seeds in order to find what I was looking for and dig through everything was making it so I was actually hesitating to get my seeds out at all. Not to mention then the open seed packets would end up spilling everywhere inside the container itself and I wouldn't know what was what anymore. Also just like heavy and annoying to lug around and I know that may seem like a small inconvenience but when you're piling up a bunch of stuff from your shed or wherever you're starting from to bring out to the garden you've got your trowel and your gloves and your clippers and your planting list and then you've got this thing well guess what happens you drop it when you drop it it shatters and you have to cover it in duct tape which is not such a great solution you know i'm all about easy gardening and I'm gonna show you what I'm doing this year instead of this method that I think is going to end up working a lot better. And since we're talking about seeds and it's time to start planning what seeds you're gonna grow in your garden, we'll get into that too. I'll talk to you about how I choose the seeds from my garden, as well as a couple other considerations in terms of choosing the variety after you've picked, say, oh, I wanna grow peppers, what variety of peppers are going to grow based on certain challenges you might be facing in your own climate. This is the solution, I'm telling you right now. We need to get this thing out of here because this right here is all you need to keep your seeds organized. And you've probably seen this method around too, but I'm gonna talk about exactly why I like it so much. So this is just a three ring binder and I ended up getting some photo sleeves for it. You can use baseball card sleeves too, but these are photo sleeves for like a three by five image. And what I like about this is that it's like a seed catalog in the most literal sense, but it's your very own personal seed catalog. I can see every single seed that I have. I can organize it in a way that makes sense for my brain and I can access the seeds really quickly, which for me was a huge hurdle because what would happen is I would pull seeds out of that other container and then I wouldn't want to go through the hassle of actually getting them back where they belong so they would just end up piling up on top of the container which was just a huge mess. Let me know if you've tried either of these methods and maybe which one you prefer if you've tried both. Having done the other method for three years now and kind of rolling my eyes whenever I saw it done this way, now that I've done it I'm like oh I can't believe I waited this long. It's so much better. I can see everything and I just love that. So I've got things organized by like my root vegetables here and then it does kind of go into more flowers and the end just gets kind of crazy. It's just a couple older things that didn't have a good spot to go in. I try to organize things not necessarily by season because I'll be planting cold season crops in spring and then again in fall, but more just like here's my melons and cucumbers go with the melons. It's, it's just what works for my brain. Obviously you have to kind of make up your own system. I'm so excited for these pumpkins. Check these out. I think I'm gonna do these on the trellis the arch trellis that I have. These are Casparita pumpkins. They're little white pumpkins. I think those are gonna be so cute. I'll link these down below. I'll make sure to link botanical interests in general below because that's where I get the majority of my seeds that I'm direct sowing or starting from seeds indoors. I've just tried a bunch of different companies already and I found that they have the best germination rate and the best high quality harvests come from botanical interest seeds. Let's talk about choosing seeds because I know this is the time of year where we're all getting a little bit overwhelmed with all of the options. So normally my first advice is that you should plant what you eat, which seems really straightforward, right? Of course, there's certain things that you may eat that may not grow as well in your climate depending on where you live, but it's a great place to start if you're feeling overwhelmed. However, I would like to make the argument that this year you also try growing a few things that you actually hate to eat. You might actually enjoy them a lot more when they're homegrown. I'm a huge veggie lover in general. I've been a vegetarian for about 20 years now, most of my life. 
and I can't really get away with disliking most vegetables, but beets, turnips, and arugula have always been plants that I've never enjoyed. And I know those are crops that can be pretty polarizing for a lot of people, so let me know if any of those resonate with you or which ones you think you might try that you don't like. I actually found that this winter, I tried growing astro arugula in the hoop house, and I loved it. It's so good winter sown. But it doesn't just matter when you're planting it, right? That astro arugula is sweeter in the winter because of the colder temperatures, but it's also better because it's astro arugula and that specific variety is less peppery and sweeter in general. It could be worth experimenting with different varieties like this touchstone gold beet, which is known to have less of that earthy dirt flavor that we don't like from beets. And this is another one that I'm going to be experimenting with this season. I do not like beets. I have tried over and over again. I have a general rule that for any foods that I don't like, I try to retry it every year or so. And beets, I've just never been able to find one that I actually enjoy. So this year we're trying the Touchstone Gold. I'll link this one down below as well. If you are someone who doesn't like beets like me, maybe you want to experiment and we can find out together if there's a variety that we can actually enjoy. There's three other considerations that I want you to keep in mind when you're choosing specific varieties for your seeds. So say you've got your general list, it's peppers, it's eggplant, you've got your greens on there, you've got your herbs on there, but what about specific varieties that can help you solve problems that you know exist in your garden? For example, here in Massachusetts, I'm in zone 6B, and we have a relatively short growing season, which means that certain crops that have a long growing season that they require to mature, like eggplant, don't do as well here, but I love eggplant. So obviously I'm gonna try and try and try to find a variety that will produce the most in the shortest amount of time possible, which leads me to this diamond eggplant. So diamond eggplant was specifically developed to be adapted to cold climates. Eggplant's a really tender crop. It actually will even produce less if it's in an area where it's getting significant wind. So this is one that you definitely want to be making sure is adapted to your climate and diamond is meant for our short season. So I'm really excited to give it a try this year and see if it's more productive for me. Once you've taken into consideration the length of your season, another thing that you want to keep in mind is planting for any known pests that you have in your area. A great example of this is squash vine borers. I know I'm not the only one who's had entire squash crops decimated by these disgusting bugs. I will admit that I have a creepy crawly issue with these things and the surgical procedure that's required to remove them, it just, it literally makes me nauseous. I will not do it. I will let a plant go before I actually do that process ever again. If you know that squash vine borers are an issue in your area, there's two things you can do. You can succession plant, you can start planting them later in the season. After after that first crop of squash vine borer eggs has already hatched in late June. And you can also plant varieties that are known to be resistant to squash vine borer or whatever pest you're dealing with. In the case of SVBs, that would be something like a cheese pumpkin, a butternut squash, or a honey nut squash. And the last consideration is disease resistance. If you're in a situation where you know you are fighting tomato blight, for example, all of the time in your garden. It might be worthwhile to look into varieties that are more blight resistant. Now, I will tell you right now, there's not a single tomato seed in this whole binder, which I know might make some of you think less of me, but I prefer to just get my tomato starts from my local nursery. They take up so much space in my grow light setup and, and they take so long to mature. It's just not worth it for me when I know I can get starts that are really healthy and strong from my nursery instead. So it's not something that I personally start from seed, but if you are and you're dealing with blight, that's something to keep in mind. The last thing that I'm gonna tell you before I get into kind of my favorite varieties that I'm most excited to grow this year is to be mindful of companion planting. Even if you're totally devoted to growing a vegetable garden, you need to have some flowers in there, for example, because Flowers can serve as a trap crop. You can have nasturtiums and marigolds in there to pull in those aphids and keep them off of your vegetable plants. And you also want flowers like zinnias that are going to attract pollinators to help your plants to grow and be as productive as possible. And there's also other types of companion plants that just improve the flavor or the productivity of your other plants in general. For example, one thing that I really love to companion plant with tomatoes is basil because it can actually improve the flavor of the tomatoes. 
Another great companion plant for tomatoes is leeks. I can do a whole video on companion planting. Just let me know if that's something you would be interested in. Okay, I'm gonna go into really quick some of the top varieties that I'm most excited to be trying in 2024. I'll link all of these down below too, of course. The first one that I'm gonna show you is this trailing nasturtium purple emperor. I love nasturtium. They are so spicy. They are so beautiful and they grow so well. And I'm always looking for different color varieties. And this is a new one that has purples, magentas, pinks, and I am so excited. I'm gonna stuff this one everywhere. I love to have trailing varieties going down the edges of my raised bed boxes. They just add a beautiful pop of color and they're a great trap crop. Another one that I'm really excited about that I've been growing all winter long and I'm gonna be doing another big crop of it for the spring is bok choy. This is bok choy choco. We also have bok choy baby choy here. It's just a smaller variety. This is great for stir fries. It's super easy to grow. I just direct sow it, seed it right in the ground and it does super well. You can even cut it back and it'll cut and come again and make you a whole new one. I set a personal goal for myself that I wanted to add more purple to my garden this year. And this is another thing that you might wanna be keeping in mind is like, what kind of colors do you want to be harvesting in your garden? And I really wanted to add more purple. So I don't have all my purple seeds in yet. I'm doing an Aurora pepper that has purple and I'm also doing a burgundy broccoli and a burgundy okra. I do have my sugar magnolia snap peas. These are a purple snap pea. Snap peas are my favorite garden snack. I just love them. I grow so many of them every year, just regular snap peas. And I'm really excited to have a purple variety because I need more color in my harvest basket. Another squash that I'm really excited to try, I know I've already talked about my Casparita that I'm very excited about, is this Lakota squash. I think this is so stunning. Isn't that beautiful? It's a really gorgeous squash, but it's more than just a decoration. It's actually a really great baking variety, and that's a lot of what I use my squash for. So I'm really interested to see how this one comes out. I'm calling this kind of my year of the squash because I have so many different squash varieties and pumpkins going in. I'm really excited to try. Last but not least, I always grow a lettuce mix. I just throw it down every week or so so that there's always fresh lettuce coming up in the garden. Instead of just a mix this year, I'm also gonna be trying some of this butter crunch, which comes up in the mixes a lot. It's one of my favorites. If you're not a salad person, what I recommend doing is getting a lettuce mix putting that in so you kind of get a buffet and you get to sample all sorts of different ones. Just make sure that listed on the packet they tell you what those varieties are. So when you find one that you like, you can go ahead and just order a packet of just that one going forward. That's all that I have for you today. Please make sure and let me know what you thought of this video in the comments and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks for gardening with me and happy growing.